73,000 years ago, a low rumbling roar was the first warning that something was very wrong. The choking ash began to fall hours later like snow in a relentless storm that lasted over two weeks. Even humans in Africa, more than 5,000 kilometers from the epicenter of the eruption, would have felt the force of Toba's wrath. The supervolcano Toba can be found on the island of Sumatra in Indonesia. It has erupted numerous times, but the one that occurred 73,000 years ago was unprecedented. The eruption, which released 2,500 cubic kilometers of magma, nearly twice the volume of Mount Everest, was the largest on Earth in the last 2 million years. It was more than 5,000 times as large as the 1980 eruption of Mount St. Helens in North America. The disaster is especially noteworthy because it occurred during a pivotal time in human prehistory, when our direct ancestors, Homo sapiens, were first leaving Africa to eventually conquer the world, and when Neanderthals and other hominins were still roaming much of Asia and Europe. The full extent of the resulting fallout and its effect on prehistoric humans remains unknown, though, because there have been no comparable eruptions in recent history. Dramatic new discoveries from archaeological digs in South Africa are now elucidating the eruption's causes and effects, as well as how they influence the evolution and migration of humans. It's possible that the eruption had dramatic influence on when and how modern humans left Africa, and the extinction of the Neanderthals, as we shall see. Older simulations of the eruption on computers had suggested it was truly catastrophic, coming close to spelling the end of prehistoric humanity. Models suggested a drop in global temperatures of around 10 degrees Celsius after the blast, based on calculations using the assumption that Toba belched out 100 times more aerosols than the 1991 eruption of Mount Pinatubo in the Philippines. This lends credence to predictions of a worldwide catastrophe and a decade-long volcanic winter. Because the aerosols would have absorbed water vapor in the atmosphere and scattered sunlight, the world would have experienced a drier climate for the next few years. Many mammalian species would have perished and our ancestors might have been wiped out as a result of this rapid decline in tree cover and concomitant expansion of grasslands. Those few primitive humans who made it through the eruption would have had to make rapid adjustments to their way of life, such as moving further away from their previous habitat in search of food and banding together with neighboring populations. Yes, it's possible that the event had a profound impact on the development of the human race. An evolutionary genetic bottleneck would have occurred if the population of modern humans, then thought to be living in Africa, had been reduced to a few thousand breeding pairs dispersed in dispersed refugia. Once these various groups had left Africa, their separate histories would have planted the seeds for their distinct genetic makeups. Nonetheless, since its inception 20 years ago, this theory has been met with skepticism, with some arguing that the magnitude of the climate shift following the explosion has been grossly exaggerated. The central point of contention centers on how much the release sulfur dioxide cooled the atmosphere. Most of the emitted sulfur dioxide reacts with hydroxyl radicals from water molecules in the atmosphere to form particles of sulfur, a highly reflective substance that bounces sunlight back into space before it can warm the Earth. This is what happens during smaller eruptions like Mount Pinatubo's. Toba's sulfur dioxide output was once thought to be 100 times that of Mount Pinatubo. The fossilized magma of Toba has recently been analyzed chemically, and those results suggest it should be about half that. We consider Toba to have been a major producer of ash rather than sulfur. He also claims that a superimpact eruption on the atmosphere is unprecedented compared to that of a regular eruption. In contrast to the rapid conversion of sulfur dioxide from Mount Pinatubo into sulfur particles, the release of sulfur dioxide from Toba would have been delayed due to a lack of OH radicals in the atmosphere. Even if some particles did form, they would have quickly clumped together and fallen to the ground instead of remaining airborne. When everything is considered, Scientists propose a new estimate of global cooling of just 2.5 degrees Celsius, which lasted for just a few years. This model suggests that the effects were primarily localized in certain areas. Temperatures may have dropped by only about 1 degree Celsius on average in places like southern Africa, which is hardly a catastrophic climate shift. This new perspective is divisive. 
warming at the top of the troposphere, the lowest layer of the atmosphere, was shown to cause additional water to be lifted into the stratosphere, so water was not a limiting factor in the model. Scientists recreated conditions that would have been challenging for humans to adapt to, at least in the northern hemisphere, by simulating a period of 10 or more years of extreme cold, dry, dark weather. However, South African archaeological and geological investigations suggest the supereruption had much less of an effect on the environment than was previously believed. First, if there were to be a sudden deforestation event due to the cooling and drying of the atmosphere, the topsoil that is no longer anchored by trees would likely wash down into valleys, where it would quickly accumulate. The researchers conclude that there was no sudden deposition of soil atop the ash layers. To bolster their case, Scientists analyzed the ratio of carbon isotopes in fossilized plant material, since different plants absorb carbon at different rates. Carbon-13 isotope levels only rose slightly after the Toba eruption, indicating that grassland environments at the time saw only a modest increase. We think of Mother Nature as being warm and cuddly, and for the most part she is, but sometimes the savagery of Mother Nature is revealed on the Earth. 99.9% .9 of all species eventually go extinct. Extinction is the norm. Scientists, philosophers and anthropologists have all pondered the question of where human consciousness first emerged. The past decade has also seen it rise to prominence as an important issue for the field of archaeology. Did the modern way of thinking develop gradually over time or suddenly emerge suddenly in the history of our species? A recent finding sheds light on a long-standing debate about the origins of sophisticated human thought, and also provides a potential strategy for how early modern Homo sapiens were able to outcompete Neanderthals and win the race to extinction. Arrowheads provide important clues about how modern humans surpassed Neanderthals and other ancient peoples after the Toba eruption. A previous theory, put forth by Stanford University anthropologist Richard Klein, suggested that such modern human behavior emerged only with the Cro-Magnons between 50,000 and 40,000 years ago, as a result of a fortunate genetic mutation that stoked our ancestors' inventiveness. But what does this have to do with the eruption? Modern humans may have had an advantage over the more primitive Neanderthals because they had access to lethal weapons. Sharpened stone blades dating back as far as 71,000 years indicate that humans who migrated out of Africa did so armed to the teeth. When modern humans first migrated out of Africa and into Europe, they likely came into conflict with native Neanderthals who were armed with handheld spears. This projectile technology, which allows one to attack from a safe distance, would have given modern humans a significant advantage in hunting and interpersonal conflict. According to the author, humans would have been more than a match for anything or anyone they met if they were armed with the bow and arrow. Our ancestors could have launched more effective and far-reaching attacks against Neanderthals and other humans with the help of stone blades. The first humans to leave Africa did so with the ability to hunt large game and compete effectively with Neanderthals using their darts and arrows. Following the discovery in South Africa of a cache of small stone blades or bladelets that formed lethal weapon tips for either arrows shot from bows or spears hurled with wooden throwers called atlatls, historians have revised their accounts of human history. While excavating an eroded cliff face at a site called Pinnacle Point on the south coast, researchers uncovered more than 70 sharp stone tips measuring no more than 5 centimeters long. The development of the technology allowed early humans to attack wild animals or human foes from a greater distance and with more devastating effect. People who possess light armaments that can be thrown long distances have immediate advantages in hunting prey and killing competitors. The blades were crafted from silkrete, a type of rock that, once heated in fire, can be flaked into a sharp edge. Silkrete is a hardened layer of volcanic ash found in a soil that is rich in silica. Silica dissolves and is redeposited to cement soil grains together in hot, arid climates where waterlogging is uncommon. A spear or dart was made by fixing long, thin flakes of stone into lengths of wood or bone with notches and snaps to create smaller tips. So did the Toba catastrophe cause a sudden spark in the mines humans in Africa to invent a new type of arrowhead? We can only speculate. 
the pinnacle point stone tools were dated to between 71,000 and 60,000 years ago, right after the massive Toba eruption, indicating that one of the earliest arms industries relied on the passing down of skills and techniques from one generation to the next. Nature magazine has published an article describing the hall in detail. Raw rock materials, wood for burning, knowledge of how to heat treat the silkrete, preparation and trimming of the blades, and finally attachment to arrows and spears are all required steps in the production of the projectile tips. Essential mental capacities are activated when one learns to master these tasks and then teach them to other. Researchers have found stone bladelets similar to those found at Pinnacle Point at other sites in South Africa and Kenya, but none are nearly as old or as well preserved. Approximately 20,000 years later, the technology traveled to other parts of Africa and Eurasia. The knockout punch delivered by early human superior weaponry and increased cooperation with one another was too much for the Neanderthals to overcome. Combine them, as modern humans did and still do, and no prey or competitor is safe. This probably paved the way for the expansion of modern humans out of Africa and the extinction of many prey as well as our sister species, such as the Neanderthals. It would have taken days, weeks, or months, with occasional interruptions for more pressing matters, to prepare the stone weapon tips. As a result, we can infer that the first humans who made weapons had the cognitive capacity to remember steps in a process and make plans for the future. In fact, the success of human migration from southern Africa to the rest of the world may be measured by the time when they first developed stone bladelets. The first waves of migrants are believed to have left Africa sometime after 100,000 years ago. They would have been more than able to hold their own against anything or anyone they encountered had they been armed with a bow and arrow. One of the early Russian rocket scientists, the great saying, Earth is the cradle of humanity, but you cannot stay in the cradle forever. Hominin species that existed at the time of the eruption would have certainly endured difficult circumstances. Scientists discovered deposits up to three meters deep on the valley floors where rivers would once have flowed, so it's safe to assume that the blanket of ash was quickly washed into the freshwater supplies. Moreover, it is certain that in the years following the eruption, early humans would have had to adapt to colder temperatures, likely having to economize significantly as food supplies dwindled. Unfortunately, no skeletons of any human species that existed at the time of the eruption have been preserved in the sediments, despite the fact that this would be a great source of information about life in the wet, tropical environment at the time. Unexpectedly, hundreds more stone tools were found in the layers directly above the ash fall, suggesting that human life continued in much the same way immediately after the eruption. In the Toba ash, they don't see much development in the realm of hand tools. They may have had to move temporarily, but within a generation or so they were back where they had been before, continuing to make the same kinds of stone tools. Yet again, that doesn't mean people in South Africa and elsewhere had it easy during the eruption. South Africa might have been an outlier, a place where people went to escape the harsh conditions of the rest of the world. The devastating effects of the volcanic eruption may have been mitigated by a number of factors. However, the results cast doubt on the widely held belief that the Toba catastrophe was catastrophic for the people who lived at the time. One of the most influential advocates of the catastrophe theory is Stanley Ambrose of the University of Illinois. He claims to have found substantial proof of technological shifts in South and East Africa after the eruption, which may have been prompted by the need to adjust to challenging new environments. Ambrose doesn't buy into the theory that modern humans migrated out of Africa before Toba. Recent research has painted a new, less catastrophic picture of the Toba eruption, which has implications for theories of human evolution and migration. Until at least 14,000 years after the Toba eruption, it was widely believed that modern humans remained in Africa. Before this time, modern humans are thought to have been mostly confined to Africa. Even if this is the case, the evidence is still important because it casts doubt on the genetic bottleneck theory of human evolution by suggesting that the survival of these species suggests the eruption may not have had a drastic impact on the Homo sapiens populations in Africa. An earlier migration would be just about possible, according to historical evidence. 
Since fossils from this time in human prehistory are extremely scarce, genetic research has been relied upon by scientists hoping to piece together our ancestors' lives. By comparing and contrasting modern indigenous populations from all over the world, looking for mitochondrial DNA differences, and calculating how long those differences would have taken to arise. The earliest possible date for a migration out of Africa was determined by scientists to be 71,000 years ago. 3,000 years have passed since the eruption of Mount Toba. But the low probability that a migration occurred before Toba is due to the large uncertainties associated with these methods. As a matter of fact, there are other reasons to question the accepted theory of a late dispersal. Artifacts found in Australia date back as far as 75,000, minus 80,000 years, thousands of years before the time period when modern humans were first theorized to have arrived there. In addition, a stone tool culture spanning 74,000 to 4,000 years ago has been discovered in Malaysia. The use of heavier hand axes was replaced by lighter tools, providing further evidence that modern humans were driving out non-modern hominins outside of Africa at this time. The consistency of the tools during this time period suggests they were all made by the same group of humans. But here's the thing. Why isn't modern mitochondrial DNA reflecting a migration to Asia so early in prehistoric times if modern humans did that? A solution that restores Toba's standing in human history may be possible. New tool technology was brought to South Asia by early migrants who migrated there from Africa around 80,000 years ago, before the Toba culture emerged. The first settlers perished more than a decade after the Toba eruption, which occurred 74,000 years ago. This second wave of migrants was armed with bows and arrows. This not only makes sense of the genetic data, but also of the pre-Toba tools. If the elderly population disappeared, there would be no trace of their DNA left behind. If this hypothesis is correct, the volcanic eruption of Toba may have had a far more significant impact on human evolution than previously thought, significantly weakening the first wave of migrants. Later, more aggressive settlers would have pushed their less aggressive ancestors off the fertile land and finished them off. Thus, the evidence points to the fact that Homo sapiens flourished just after the eruption, using new weapons to eventually drive the Eurasian human species to extinction. Although much more archaeological evidence is needed to support it, it's an appealing proposition that promises to tie up the loose ends of the other theories. Human remains, or even a skeleton encased in the ash, could finally put an end to the debate if they are discovered during the ongoing excavations.